Uh, so, uh, hey guys, I'm back with another science video, and this one sort of combines science and electronics together. So, um, it's uh, how silicon chips are actually made. And so, um, th this is, um, I think the picture is taken from Intel's processing plant in Arizona. But first, you got to convert silica into sand, or sand to silicon, sorry. And sand is a compound of silicon, silicon dioxide and um, other stuff. So they heat it to get the oxygen out and then they put it through um, they, uh, they grind it to a fine powder and it reacts with hydrogen chloride in a um, reactor at 300 degrees Celsius and it gives them a liquid compound and then they can purify that down and then what they do is they remove um, the, the stuff through fractional whatever that is, I don't know what that means, um, so they get 99.99% pure, and then they convert it into a cylindrical crystal, um, which means that um, when, when it's in the form that they had it in, so they, um, w when the silicon comes out, silicon, sorry, comes out of the process where it's 99.99% pure, it's in many different crystal shapes, it's, it's got many different crystals in it which isn't suitable for the, um, electronics because um, there's different boundaries between them and then that affects all the electrical behavior uh, through the different crystals so they need it to all be one crystal so what they do is they melt it on a rotating quartz crystal and then um, a tiny crystal of it is dropped in and slowly withdrawn and so that um, the crystal acts as a seed, basically, so the rest of the silicon aligns up with that crystal, and now it's one big crystal. So now they got to cut it into wafers to maximize surface area, because chips are normally, almost 99.9% .9 of the time, made um, on the surface. So they want to get the biggest surface area possible, so they slice it into wafers, and they use many knives at a time. And, um, like, they... they always have a slurry of silicon carbide to keep like the surface from being ruined and so um, they do that and then they put nitric oxide on it and other acids or nitric acid oxide uh, it oxides the surface and gives a thin layer of silicon dioxide and then the hydrofluoric acid dissolves away leaving a really clean silicon surface without any marks very smooth great for making silicon chips so now they have to make an oxide layer. Um, and so um, first they just put it under oxides and um, then it gets its oxide layer. And then they add a photoresist. And then I'm referring to this diagram right here. Then they add a photographic mask and they bombard the thing with UV light. And the photographic mask saves the photoresist where it was and where it wasn't the ultraviolet light will essentially dissolve the photoresist away. Then I think they, uh, step E, it seems they would add, uh, um, let's see, I'll scroll down a bit here, um, let's find out what they do, step E. The photoresist, um, let's see, so they, um, okay, so now they use hydro hydrofluoric acid to dissolve away parts of the oxide layer, it says, I think. And then a solvent is used, <coughs> excuse me, to remove the rest of the photoresist. So now they have an oxide layer in the shape of the circuit features that they need. And so now they would have to add some N and P type regions. And so um, they use a boron ion beam to create, I think, P type, and a phosphorus beam to create N type. And then they, um, so those, they basically add impurities to give it its type. And then they have to add gates to the MOSFETs. This is assuming making MOSFETs, because most chips are made of MOSFETs if they're, um, if they're CMOS parts, which a lot of chips are CMOS. So, um, it can made, silicon is actually a poor conductor, but they add impurities to give it. So they add phosphorus 
and so um, which has one more outer electron than silicon, so dropping it in introduces free electrons, which makes it positive, you know, because electricity electrons are electricity. N-type material is more conductive than pure silicon because of its negative charge, so boron has one fewer. So then it creates P-type material with more um, protons, so it's positive. And so then right here you can see when it's off, there's no P-type connecting the two P-types for the source and the drain. But when you apply some uh, voltage to the gate, in the MOSFET is voltage, um, in a um, DTL, no, no, not a DTL, in a, um, a bipolar transistor is current, but MOSFET is voltage, um, then the P-type channel is created below the silicon di dioxide that connects the two P-types, and then it lets electricity flow. And now they coat it with copper tracks, which is essentially um, connectors that um, connect the, um, the N and the P-types together, and so um, now this wafer can contain billions of MOSFETs, and um, so then they, uh, they add insulation, so when they add the copper, this doesn't short out everything, and they add this oxide by oxidizing it in a furnace, and that gives it silicon dioxide. So now you can't make connections to the MOSFETs because it's coated with an um, Non non-conductive material, and so um, so to actually make the connections, they use hydrochloric acid to etch holes in the silicon dioxide and through the photoresist to the actual and in the p-type um, connections, and then trenches in the pattern that require interconnecting tracks tracks that cross over each other are etched into the silicon dioxide, and then the top layer of copper is applied by electroplating, and this fills the trenches and the holes, and then this can create vias through the silicon dioxide, so that you can have wires that cross over each other. And now the wafer is entirely coated in copper, and they don't want that because everything is shorted out. So chemical mechanical polishing um, removes the excess copper so that it's only left where it should be, where it's making the connections. And then you can see here is a picture of um, some of the connections. And so now they have to sort the chips, right, um, the good and the bad chips, and um, each big wafer, these things are huge, can, contains many dyes, and um, not all of them will actually work correctly. And so I think this specific one is carrying computer processors, this um, picture right here. And so they use like an arm or something that has um, the contacts on it, and it contacts the contacts on the die, and push it through paces, and so if it's completely working, it's functional, and if it is broken, you know, non-functional, and you say here the ratio about is about 60% um, functional, um, but sometimes the die will only partially function, and they can sew these as lower specification parts, so they actually make um, all their processors in the same range, even if it's a hundred, uh, I don't know, um, they, they have one gigahertz processor and a five gigahertz processor. Those processors were more than likely made through the same process. It's just that one of them, like ever, the five gigahertz processor, everything's working, and the one gigahertz processor, you know, part only part of it is working. And so now they um, saw up to the individual the individual dies, so they saw off the excess silicon, and then they package it. Um, and they basically, they bond the dye to some plastic or metal packaging, what have you, so that it can actually survive in the outside world, outside a, a clean lab room. So, thanks for watching this. Uh, I'll include a, a link to this, um, site here. Um, let's see. Um, do 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 um, it's pcplus.techradar.com forward slash node forward slash 3059. And so I'll probably include a link in the description, but that's really just for me, so I can put it there. But, um, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the video.